What I see that's really spoken about in sort of the monogamous framework is they tell people to rely on the structure itself for their security. Ooh, right. And then what I see is that doesn't really work. And it doesn't actually really work in monogamy either. Right? But, and so one of my emphasis is that, you know, don't depend on the structure. You might still have certain structures, but don't depend on that for secure attachment in your relationship. Depend on the relational experience that you have. How are you treating each other? How are you showing up with each other? That's what matters. Welcome to the Multi Amory Podcast. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. We believe in looking to the future of relationships, not maintaining the status quo of the past. So whether you're monogamous, polyamorous, swinging, casually dating, or if you just do relationships differently, we see you and we're here for you. On this episode of the Multi Amory Podcast, we are speaking with Jessica Fern, a psychotherapist, public speaker, and trauma and relationship expert. And she is the author of the upcoming book, Poly Secure Attachment, Trauma, and Consensual Non Monogamy. Today, we're going to be talking about attachment theory, one of our favorite things. But we're specifically going to be talking about how our attachment style can intersect with trauma and what this means for non-monogamous relationships and strategies for moving toward more secure attachments. So, Jessica, thank you so much for joining us today. Yes, thank you for having me. Yeah, so this is super exciting. So your book is going to be coming out in October, and I've already told people like in our private Patreon group that I'm super excited for this book to be out there. I know on this show, we talk quite a bit about attachment theory. Um, I do feel that what I've seen in non-monogamous communities, at least people who are savvy, really like thinking about attachment theory. Um, so I guess the first thing that I want to pose to you in two minutes, let's say, could you summarize <laughs> the entirety of attachment theory for our listeners who wow. are not as familiar with that? It can be probably longer than that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, in one sentence, it's we need love, right? Mm, mm, true <laughs> that. True yes. That. Yes. So I think, right, the brief, broad stroke of attachment is that as human babies, we our first survival strategy is emotionally bonding with a caretaker will take care of us and be kind and be attuned to us. And so depending on how responsive and attuned and available our caretaker is, we either develop a secure attachment to them or we have an insecure attachment. So if our parents are inconsistent or inaccessible or unresponsive um, or unreliable, a child's going to feel, feel more insecure in their relationship to the parent and then they're going to go on and feel more secure within themselves and within the world, right? And those early attachment experiences are sort of the blueprint that we then go on to replicate in our romantic relationships, especially. Right. And, and this theory has been developed from a lot of research based uh, from, from my understanding. So please feel free to jump in and yes. correct me, uh, you know, uh, research, uh, really famous research about the quote unquote strange situation. situation. Yeah. yeah. Wherein, uh, very, yeah, it's where a very small child is separated from their caregiver, like left alone in a room for a little while. And then researchers are looking at how does the child respond when the caregiver comes back into the room. Is that, that's correct? Just that is it. So they're looking at both how the child responds when the mom, it usually was a mother in this case, this was research starting in the sixties and seventies, but still continues. And so they'd look at how does the child respond in the room? And then how does the child respond when left with a stranger? And then what happens on reunion with the mother? Right. So a child that is more securely attached, they're going to feel comfortable around their own parent and they're going to feel free to explore the room of toys. That's a big thing is that exploration comes online when we feel secure. And then when the parent leaves, they're going to actually feel distressed. That's a healthy thing. You know, where's my parent? And when they come back, they're going to feel really comforted and soothed by the parent. So that's what we would see in a secure attachment. But in the insecure strategies, so a child who's um, classified or labeled as more avoidant is going to be less engaged with their parent. And when their parent leaves, they don't show signs of stress <laughs> and they don't even explore the room a lot. 
And then when the parent comes back, it's almost like they don't notice, right? What's really interesting about those kids though, is they look kind of calm and collected on the outside and they're internally, they're physiologic, physiologically under stress. Wow. So they're actually not okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right? But what's happened is they've deactivated their attachment system. Right. Then one of the other classifications is more of a hyperactivated attachment system, which is the anxious or preoccupied. And so that the child's going to be more clingy to the parent, even when they're in the room. Um, when the parent leaves, they're going to feel a lot of distress and confusion. And then when the parent comes back, um, they're usually then again, really clingy, but they're not soothed right away. It's interesting. The parent coming back doesn't feel like enough because they're afraid the parent's going to leave. Huh. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so initially that was mostly what they saw. And then years later, they reinterpreted and found that there was a third category of disorganized where yeah, this is, that was new to me for sure. <laughs> I don't know about the two of you, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. And this is usually when there's been trauma and we can talk a little bit more about what it looks like in adulthood, but in this strange situation, um, you'd see where the child would want the parent and then maybe be aggressive to, towards the parent, you know, go towards them and then push away from them. Um, maybe even freeze and be very afraid when the parent was gone or when the parent came back even. Hmm. So you see a lot of signs of like more severe physiological stress and also like behavioral reactivity. Wow. Right. And so yeah. something I want to clarify here is that I think that usually these kind of attachment styles or behaviors that show up in children, at least most resources that I've read, chalk it up to, yeah, there was probably a time where you were trying to get an attachment need met in a particular way and your caregiver responded in a particular way, maybe in a healthy way, maybe in an unhealthy way, or they consistently responded in an unhealthy way. And that that contributed to having potentially some maladaptive strategies for seeking that attachment. But but yeah. I appreciate that you do clarify in your book, though, that this is not all about just laying all the blame on your parents <laughs> fucking up, <Yeah>. right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's where I came up with that nested theory of attachment and trauma, which in the book, I look at not just the parent-child relationship, but how do things like um, the home environment, the culture that we're in, the society that we're in, the global level issues that we're facing that can all impact attachment. So, for example, like one of the main predictors of disorganized attachment is the mother working too many hours outside of the house. Well, hmm. that's an that's a societal issue. That's usually an issue of poverty, not necessarily hmm. her being just a bad mom. Quote unquote. Right. Right. Yeah. So it's not about parent blaming. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. And so then just to connect the dots a little bit for our listeners, you know, these these behaviors that we see in children, like you said, then kind of serve as a model for then how we end up attaching to people as adults. So <laughs> could you also go over in rough strokes, just kind of like what, what this that tends to looks look like? like? Yeah, as adults. yeah. Yeah. So for the insecure styles, the avoidant is going to be someone who keeps people a bit more at arm's length, right? They're not going to show as much vulnerability. They're going to pull away when they see their partners showing vulnerability. Usually they're labeled as more like cerebral, <laughs> right? Mm. Or intellectual. They're usually very mm. competent in those realms too. Like they usually like do really well in the work fields. Um, but they're people that are more of a lone wolf or Stan Tacken uses the nautical metaphors of someone who's more of an island. Hmm. Yeah. 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 And it's not that they don't want relationships. Um, there's a kind of a joke in the attachment world that the avoidance style wants to be in relationship and they want you in the house, but just in the other room. <laughs> oh god yeah. oh god it's too real yeah. <laughs> exactly. it's like having competitions <laughs> right now. Yeah. yeah yeah and so it comes though from and usually they're very self-reliant they really pride themselves on being so competent and not needing right and they usually don't like when other people need things right the word needy gets thrown around mm -hmm. um but 
you know, and they've deactivated their attachment system, not because they actually don't have those attachment needs, but because they learned, I can't rely on the people around me. So I only have myself to rely on because it, and it might even be unsafe to rely on others. So they have a lot of struggle with depending or even interdependence with their partners. So that was specifically what the dis more disattached from a partner avoidant. what do you call that avoidant attachment yeah, avoidant, dismissive yes and i know personally i'm more of what maybe the avoidant would call the clingy side so can you get into <laughs> that one and then finally the secure and disorganized yes. because yeah i read stan tatkin's book um and he never spoke about that he only spoke of the other three right uh, so yeah i'm interested to get into yes. a little bit more of the disorganized as well Great. So the anxious preoccupied though has more anxiety and they like, they're called the wave from Stan Tatkin's work where, you know, the avoidant is more withdrawing and they are leaning in big time. And so their system is hyper activated. So they're super hyper focused on their partner, what their partner is doing, isn't doing. Do you love me? Oh, but maybe not enough. Oh, did we have oh, we didn't have sex this time. When are we going to have sex next time? There's just a lot of focus outward. Uh-huh. And then they tend to lose themselves in that, right? Mm-hmm. And might not always know, what do I feel? What do I need? Um, but they're very sensitive. This is one of their strengths, is they're very sensitive into the subtleties of the relational dynamics and any small shift. But Usually they, even though they're sensitive to small shifts, they usually think it's personal to them. Oh, are you mad at me? When not Mm -hmm. necessarily the case, right? It might just be like, I'm, I'm just hungry. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, um, yeah. And usually this person in a relationship gets labeled as being needy or, you know, uh, what is, what do we call people when they're like high, high clingy? Yeah. Exactly. Um, then the disorganized is called disorganized in childhood and it's called fearful avoidant in adulthood. Okay. That one this I've heard style, before. I've heard people talk yeah. about fearful, fearful avoidant. Fearful, not fearful avoidant. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And it, it, the disorganized definition comes from there isn't a coherent organized strategy going on here in the same way that sort of the avoidant or the preoccupied has. Right. And, but most of the time it vacillates between those two. So someone like what, what happens with this style is their attachment system to move towards people is really high, but then so is the defense protective mechanisms. So Diane Poole Heller, I love, she says they have this one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake at the same time. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. And so that's exhausting. Right. It can be exhausting to be that person. It can be exhausting to be in relationship too. So they might really in a more aggressive version of the fearful avoidant, they might really demand and criticize what, you know, this is what I need from you. And then they get it and they then criticize that and push it away. Hmm. Right. Um, in maybe not as much of aggressive, it can be someone who's just stuck in the freeze response a lot, right. Mm -hmm. And has a lot of like perfectionism going and like almost paralysis of just being in a lot of fear. Yeah. But like fear, uh, fear of abandonment specifically then, or fear of fear of abandonment. So this is a great question. So the avoidant is going to have fear of engulfment. Hmm. The anxious is going to have fear of abandonment and the fearful avoidant is going to struggle with both. (laughs) Got it. I haven't haven't heard specifically that term engulfment used before. What do you mean by that? (laughs) Yeah. Like I'm going to, Ooh, you're going to come in and take over me or I'm going to completely lose myself Mm -hmm. in the relationship if we get too close or too committed. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that term better than because I feel like avoidant dis- dismissives are usually described as having a fear of commitment. Yeah, but I, I like distinguishing engulfment as kind of a step beyond just commitment. It's like the very, the really scary version of commitment says Ex- me the avoidant. Right, exactly. <laughs> well, the, the avoidant, right, I don't love the terms avoidant and dismissive. And in the book, I make that distinction, like in the healthy version, it's just someone who's really advocating for their independence, (laughs) right? That that's Mm -hmm. their primary value. Whereas, you know, the other style of the other end of preoccupied is really looking for connection. 
Right? Yeah, I, I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> Rather <laughs> than just like, wow, this person's super clingy and this person's super avoidant of you. Yeah, yeah. I do it because, you know, I, I do find myself personally to maybe be more clingy in some of those ways, but also I am attuned to people. So I, yeah, I appreciated you saying that very much. <laughs> Good. Yeah. So, yeah. So if we can talk about then like the cherry on top of the attachment Sunday, which is the secure attachment. <laughs> like, secure. Yeah. Secure the <laughs> yeah. So secure, I mean, in its essence would be like, I'm comfortable alone and I'm comfortable in connection you know, so, and it doesn't mean they don't have insecurities. I think that's a misconception is that they don't have any insecurities. Of course they do. But someone who's is securely functioning when they have insecurities, instead of doing this attack or withdraw dance, mm. they can bring them up to their partner and say, Hey, I'm feeling insecure. And this mm. is what I need for you from you. Right. So they're able to ask for what they need. They're comfortable with their own needs. They're able to usually communicate well with their partners about boundaries, requests, renegotiating things. Um, they usually want to meet the needs of their partner. You know, they're not intimidated by their partners having needs and things like that. Yeah. And so in, in non-monogamy, what you see is when people are securely functioning you know, they, um, they have an easier time, right. With managing all of the complexities of all the conversations that need to happen, all the ways we have to become advocates for ourselves, all the ways we can no longer disregard our needs and feelings, right. And be able to have difficult conversations. People who are securely functioning are better at usually at compersion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're usually better with their metamors. <laughs> they're mm -hmm. not taking everything personally or as an offense or as a disrespect. Right? Yeah. I mean, right. when I, when I think about that, <clears throat> so, okay. It's like most of the stuff out there written about attachment theory and relationships is very much focused on how it applies to monogamy, how it applies yeah. to this pretty, bubble. Right. Yeah. Yeah, this pretty <laughs> conventional model of it. And I think the thing that's interesting about non-monogamy is that if the whole model you've ever been given for what security even means in a romantic relationship, non-monogamy is suddenly pulling that out from under you, like intentionally. Exactly. And yeah. I, I mean, yeah, that seems, I mean, I can definitely say like I've seen it in other people and myself that, that there's suddenly that challenge of all those insecurities coming up. And I could definitely see that kind of exacerbating whatever sorts of attachment struggles or challenges you might have. Exactly. Cause non-monogamy is more of an insecure relationship structure. It just doesn't have that secure structure that monogamy does in the same way. Or at least yeah. that monogamy claims to have. Exactly. <laughs> Obstensibly. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> So, so yeah. So what does this look like then in, in non-monogamy? What part of it? Just, I guess, how did those show up? Like in the, yeah. you know, the research and the writing that you've done, like how do, um, like, like what are, I guess, some of the key differences that you've noticed between the way that it's written about in monogamous relationships and how it applies to non-monogamous relationships? Like what's left yeah. out? What are they missing? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. What I see that's really spoken about in sort of the monogamous framework is they tell people to rely on the structure itself for their security. Ooh, right. And then what I see is that doesn't really work and it doesn't actually really work in monogamy either. Right. <laughs> but, and so one of my emphasis is that you know, don't depend on the structure. You might still have certain structures, but don't depend on that for secure attachment in your relationship. Depend on the relational experience that you have. How are you treating each other? How are you showing up with each other? That's what matters. So I think that's what's left out a lot. And the one or two things that do talk about non-monogamy and attachment really emphasize a very hierarchical one way to do, you know, non-monogamy that's just not going to work for everybody. Right. Yeah. I appreciate in the book, you, you go into this really long and really detailed list of 
just signs that you may be relying on your relationship structure yes. for security rather than the relationship experience itself. You know, so things like, yeah, you live with a partner and share bills, but you don't feel cherished or yeah. or appreciated, you know, things like that, which I thought was really, really interesting because I know we definitely see, especially a lot of people who are newly opening up their relationship that, that, yeah, you know, I think that we really are encouraged to lean on that in a very traditional sense. And a lot of people are left having to really redefine that. Yeah. Or they just try to replicate that in non-monogamy and maybe some of that works, but a lot of it then doesn't. You know, mm-hmm. so people are really left without a roadmap. Yes. So I'm interested in getting into perhaps some of the pitfalls that can occur when looking at attachment theory, because I know a lot of people tend to kind of grab on to like, well, OK, I'm anxious attached. You have to deal with it <laughs> or something along those lines. Um, it, so we do have listeners that are a bit concerned about like over identifying with an attachment yeah. style or blaming someone's attachment <laughs> style for like why they are a certain way or something along those lines. So can you talk a little bit about maybe some of the pitfalls in attachment theory? And I I did find it very interesting and, and I agreed with it hugely that like you're not necessarily just one. Exactly. You yeah, you can be securely attached while also having a disposition, a predisposition towards, you know, anxious attachment or something else. So... Yes, exactly. I think with any typology, whether it's like your astrological sign or your Enneagram type or your Myers-Briggs, we can get stuck into like, oh, I'm just a seven or I'm just a Taurus. And that's how it is. <laughs> right. And and we're much more complex. And so with attachment, exactly. We're not just solidly one style. You know, we can experience different styles with different, well, children experience it with different parents right? They can be differently attached to their different parents. Um, We have different attachment styles with different partners. So that gets really exposed in non-monogamy in a way that can surprise people (laughs) because they might have always been more of one style and then they open up and they're seeing themselves expressed differently and they're just, Mm -hmm. they don't know what to do. Yeah. Um, And even in the same relationship over time, our styles can change. Mm. Yeah. And I think even though it kind of is usually presented as this typology, most people don't feel that way. They're like, oh, yeah, sometimes I'm a little anxious and then some more of the times I tend to be withdrawn. But, you know, we kind of know there's more nuance. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we collected some listener questions before this episode and oh, it's, nice. I mean, we got, oh my gosh, so much response on this thread. Like so many people yeah. had questions, but I will say a huge bulk of those questions was some variation of, um, I feel different attachment styles with different partners. Is that weird? Is that normal? Or some variation of I found that I I go back and forth, you know, all the time. Is that weird? Is that normal? You know, so yes. it is really interesting to see that. It's, I mean, it sounds like, yes, it's very much normal. Yes, it's what I see. So, yes, I think it is very common. And there's nothing wrong with people for that. Because we're responding to the attachment style of the person. And that's going to vary as well. Right. Yeah. That different partners are going to bring out different um, reactive patterns in us. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that makes and I sense. think even, you know, not to see this like as a dysfunction or a pathology. Right. But like these styles came out of a survival necessity. Hmm. Right. They're actually quite wise. Mm, yeah, you know, mm. but yet we don't want to stay stuck in them. And we do need to kind of grow and evolve beyond the style itself. Right. So you, like, I wouldn't use our style as an excuse because it can't forever be an excuse. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I right. guess. Right. Yeah. That, that's actually something else that I was curious about is that, you know, a lot of this is based on research with children and how we develop attachment styles is how, how changeable is this over our lives? Is it just kind of, maybe you happen to be someone who vacillates between a couple of different ones, but you're stuck with it and you just got to learn to deal with it the best. Or is it, can this change based on your experiences and your relationships and things like that? Yeah. So it absolutely can change. That is the good news is that if you have experienced any of the insecure attachment styles, 
um, you can jump between them depending on, I think there was a study that showed in adults that even every four years, their attachment style changed. Wow. Of course, this was with a monogamous population. And I had wondered how much of that is because they changed partners, you know, that mm. relationships might only be two or three, yeah. four years. Yeah. Right. Um, cause, um, so yes, our attachment styles can change, but the good news is that we can go from an insecure style to an earn secure is what it's called. Mm. That right. usually earn doesn't secure. happen on its own. It takes the intentional work of, you know, healing our attachment wounds, working through our painful past, and then looking at the behaviors and beliefs that we're continuing to participate in as an adult that we do need to change. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I also wanted to ask, you know, and of course you go into this a little bit more in detail in the book, but how does trauma intersect with attachment theory? I mean, we did get a specific listener question, which I thought was interesting. Um, This person asked, you know, are attachment styles just dysfunctional trauma responses? (laughs) It's a great question. And I think it's hard to tease them apart, honestly, that yes, our attachment styles have come from trauma, whether you call it a capital T trauma or like a lowercase trauma, Mm -hmm. right? That the Mm -hmm. biological, emotional, psychological needs of that responsiveness, you know, availability and attunement weren't happening, you know? And so it's not just overt neglect or overt abuse, Right. But those would be the traumas as well. So, yeah, these are adaptations from trauma. Absolutely. And then oh, go on. Well, I was just going to ask, like, what what are things that would fall under that category of the lowercase T trauma? Yeah. I call it the invisible trauma of the middle class. (laughs) <laughs> where I see it wow. a lot in yeah. some of my clients, right? You're all like, oh shit. <laughs> it's like, and it usually is white folks, but not always, but it's, you know, middle-class white kids who had all of their material needs met for them. But that sense of being seen and that warmth, the emotional connection wasn't there. Mm. And yet they had everything materially. So how could they complain? Mm. Right. And you're Mm -hmm. kind of taught, well, people had it worse than you. Right. Mm -hmm. So that could be one of those, like, it's, it's not even noticed societally as a trauma, but just being in a home where, you know, you're overscheduled all the time and it's always about extracurricular activities or achievement and grades and looks versus like, oh, I love you for who you are, you Mm -hmm. know? Yeah. So that could be some of it. Um, it could just be, you know, parents even who were loving, um, but were, you know, didn't have money. So they're working too much and they just weren't around, you know? So again, someone's like, oh, but my parents did love me or, or my parents are still together. Like there was never something big and obvious. Or maybe one absent parent versus one that is there or because you have, yeah, you've, I've heard you say mom a lot. So I guess I'm curious, like, what if you have one that's there and one that is not? Can that exist and and make something happen to a kid, I guess? (laughs) I'm assuming yes. Yeah. Yeah, Well, I even think of like my own history here, right? I had had a single mom who was married several times. Mm -hmm. So, and then I had my dad who was a drug addict and an alcoholic. Right. So there was my attachment with him that was pretty severely severed. And then his, he got married. So there was an attachment to his wife that was pretty complicated. Right? Right. But I had a stepfather who was my secure attachment. Wow. Right. And it was like, thank goodness for the stepfather. Right. Wow. Who really became what allowed me to be resilient, you know, And so, yes, we can have this multitude of, especially now with sort of blended families and the integration of step families that can either help attachment or it can hinder, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I like that because it's different attachments to each of these different people in your life. Like, yeah, I grew up with a single mom and my grandmother and my father was never around. So exactly that kind of thing. And I had different attachments with each of those people in my life. So, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, that is really interesting. I know in my like in my own personal therapy work as an on the receiving end of therapy, thank goodness. Um, you know, it's been really interesting to actually really expand my scope of thinking about the places that I did have secure attachment as a child. Yes. Hmm. Because again, I do think that so many of the resources really just limit it to this traditional kind of two parent model you know, mom and dad, and that's all we can think about, you know, when, when I, when I actually thought about it, I was like, Oh wait, I actually had this super secure attachment to my grandparents, you know, and they were there and all the time and they lived next door and they actually created this really wonderful model. I think for me that helped me in like my more secure attachments as an adult. And so I think, yeah, there really is something to be said about kind of expanding the way we, we think about these things. Exactly. Or sometimes it's teachers or a coach Mm -hmm. or someone like that, that Mm. just showed some interest in us, you know, and that that can be a way to go, Oh yeah, that person showed me something different. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What about things later in life then? Like, Mm -hmm. like a divorce or exactly, you know, right. And so we, and maybe another lowercase T trauma. Exactly. Well, we don't talk about these things, but they absolutely are attachment ruptures or Mm. attachment traumas. And it could be, It could be a divorce, a breakup. Um, It could be, you know, a children leaving, child leaving for college. It could be, you know, the death of your best friend. You know, all of these things definitely can create attachment ruptures. You know, I went through, you know, as an adult, I went through, I think it was within a two year period, I had four major losses. Mm. And then I was kind of disorganized for a year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. thankfully I knew like, Oh, I know why this is happening, but my nervous system's pretty fried right now from all of these losses, you know, and they weren't all deaths. It was almost harder to deal with the like ghosting loss, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> cause right. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and I see a lot of folks in non-monogamy have to deal with that. Yeah. So we can even feel secure, but then go through traumas, whether it's relational or a hurricane or a pandemic, right. That then create these wobbly attachment experiences after. Wow. So we want to go on to talk about, uh, specifically ways of finding good partners as well as ways (laughs) that you can work to improve your own Uh, like the amount of security that you feel in your attachments, as well as questions that we've gotten from our listeners specifically for you. But first, we want to take a quick moment to talk to our listeners about how you can support this show, help keep this content coming, help keep this show growing and making this podcast available to everyone out there for free. So the one attachment book that I've read was Stan Tatkin's book. What was it called? Uh, Wired for Love. That's the one. Oh, mm-hmm. that's not the just attached one who wrote. Just no, attached. It, it was t- two people wrote attached, but Wired for Love was Stan Tatkin, right? If I am correct on that, I believe I am. But yes, yes. you are. And <laughs> he talks a lot about just like, well, find a partner that's secure, and then you will become secure. <laughs> um, and a lot of attachment resources out there kind of do that. Um, yeah. And it was one of the many many things that I loved about your book was. It is, you talk so much about the internal and kind of healing from within rather than just like finding another person to fix you. But um, we do have people out there who are, who asked us like, how is it that you do find a securely attached person? Yeah. How do you find a securely attached person? This used to be a drop down menu on dating apps. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And a filter preference, right? Right. I mean, there is some truth that yes, if you're dealing with an insecure style and trying to work through it, being with a partner who can show up in more secure ways is going to help. (laughs) Absolutely. Right. And yet what I've also seen is that when two people or multiple people are intentional about this, like they might say, Hey, I'm, we're both dealing with an anxious style. So how can we start to show up together in more secure ways and they can work on it together. So it's not like you all have to be, you know, done and secured and figured out kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I think there does have to be uh, an awareness of this and an intentional, let's do something different and work through this together. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And does that get to the question? Yeah. Well, I mean, could we go into that a little bit more? Like what recommendations Mm -hmm. do you have then for, for that scenario, right? Where it's like, 
we realize that this is going on, or maybe even just by yourself, you realize, gosh, I'm having a really hard time dating because I'm so insecure. I just like cling on to them so hard and everyone runs away screaming or, right. you know, I'm so avoidant that it's like, cool, let's go out, whatever. I don't care. You know, right. like, I'm not <laughs> making emotional connections. Yeah, exactly. What, what can we, what do yes. we, what do we do besides just, you know, resign ourselves to a life you know, with our cats. Well, not that that's bad. <laughs> Actually, that sounds kind of awesome. But... I mean, I love your cats. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Well, in the book, I come up with the acronym I call HEARTS, which is sort of here are some of the things to do in relationship and then also solo that people can work on. So would it be helpful to just name what those are? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Well, and even before that, I'll say just... I don't want to underestimate just the awareness. The awareness isn't sufficient, you know, but it is a big step in just knowing like, oh, I'm struggling with attachment insecurity, whichever style it is, you know, and the desire to heal through it and wanting to do things differently. So just that alone, I think is really important, you know, awareness and the desire to change. But the things that I came up with are, um, First, it's about being here, about being present. So being present with our partners and really defining together, what does that look like? What does that mean? You know, what it means to be present with oneself, which is often missed, mm-hmm. right? But we kind of can't be in relationship to ourself or with another if we're not fully present, right? And not just physically in the room kind of thing, right? And then the next thing is express delight, I actually love this because this is not talked about widely in the attach in like the common attachment literature. Um, but express delight is that just feeling or the, the oozing that comes from one person to another. That's just like, I'm so happy you exist. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like I'm so grateful that you're alive and that we get to share time together. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that real felt sense of just, I delight in your beingness so to speak, not just what you do for me and how you make my life better, but just in you. Right. And so that needs to be cultivated in partnership, but then also for ourselves. Mm. Mm. The next thing is attunement. And this is what, you know, whether monogamous or non-monogamous, I see most couples need to learn about how do I attune first to myself and know what it means to really be present with my internal landscape. And then how do I tune into my partner and just be curious, right? How are you? Where are you? What's going on? Yeah. Right. Then rituals and routines. That's one of the next things that people can work on. So especially with when healing attachment, I see that it's almost like a cast is needed for a while. Like when there's Mm. been a broken Mm -hmm. bone, you don't wear a cast forever, but you do need it for a while. And that can be what some people really benefit from having like, yeah, I do need sort of our standing date. You know, mm. I do need to have our little routines and rituals, both mm. profound and mundane to sort of feel, you know, um, the relevance of this bond, so to speak. Right. 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 Yeah. That made that, wow. Yeah. That, that broken bone metaphor makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Or scaffolding. That may be another metaphor to use. Like when we're building a new structure together, there is that scaffolding that goes on the outside for a while, but then it doesn't stay. <laughs> right. But especially if two or a few people are healing their attachment together. Um, then the next is turning towards after conflict. Mm-hmm. So really about rupture and repair. And there's a phrase in the attachment world and even couples therapy that like rupture is inevitable. Right? Right. Some people get really hung up on like, well, we should have never even had ruptures or a good relationship mm-hmm. is, oh, we never fight. And it's like, not really. Mm-hmm. But when there's miscommunications or disagreements, how do you repair with each other? So really knowing what repair work means. Mm. And I think the biggest thing, this is one of the biggest things I'm seeing with healing individual attachment is how do I repair with myself when I fall short of my standards? 
Oof. Wow. So, yeah. Wow. 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 Okay. <laughs> so, so that's inner critic work, right? Mm-hmm. That's, I have something I'll be coming out with soon, which I'm calling the shame triangle, which is how do I work with the inner critic, the shame, and then the escaper, the part that wants to not have to deal with any of that. Right? Wow. Yeah. Wow, wow, yeah. Wow. And, and when there's been trauma or attachment wounds, I haven't yet seen anyone who doesn't then experience some form of harsh inner critic, a lot of shame, and then all the ways we try to escape. Mm, right. Yeah. Yeah. So let me just say, first of all, this hearts acronym, uh, when I read it in the book, I messaged Emily and Jace to be like, Oh my God, she made it. She made an acronym. She really is a multi-amorous. <laughs> it's amazing. Totally. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I will say, I just really appreciate. We also got a lot of listeners expressing frustration that so many of the attachment resources out there are like, yeah, you should aim for secure attachment and just, you know, work on it. You'll get there. <laughs> just, luck. just, you know, just try to grow in that direction. And you'll be fine. And it feels like very few resources lay it out in this way of like, here's some very clear, actionable things that you can do or some questions that you can ask or conversations you can have to help mend this. Yes. Yeah. That was my frustration too, for years of just being like, how do I do this? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> like, yeah. And where's the, the questions or the conversations to have? So of course, you know, hearts may not be perfect, but it's a start. <laughs> so yeah, so far I've said the heart and then the S the hearts is secure attachment with self, which is really where you're applying the heart to yourself. Hmm. Right. Yeah. And this is key, I think, in general, but if you're going to be embarking on non-monogamy, there really needs to be more of a secure attachment with self to be able to navigate that all the complexity and the uncertainty that happens from this more insecure relationship structure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It feels like it's really crucial. Um, so closer to the end here, I want to talk about some listener questions that we've gotten. And we've kind of sprinkled those in a little bit throughout. Um, I tried to kind of group some recurring themes together and paraphrase a little bit. So um, I'm not necessarily just for those of you listening. I'm not necessarily reading anybody's question verbatim, but uh, tried to condense from your many, many, many questions and comments <laughs> um, <laughs> so that we could ask them in an efficient way. Um, so yeah, I wanted to ask about, uh, we got some questions about, you know, helpful tips specifically for avoidant attached people and being in relationship with avoidant attached people, because a lot of the resources out there basically say, yeah, don't date those guys. Just don't deal with them. (laughs) Just don't, just don't even, you see them coming, you know, go the other way and like kind of treat them like the bad guys. And of course, being more avoidantly inclined myself, I, I have some ire about that. Um, but I was wondering what, what your thoughts were on that. So there's two questions there, right? Like tips for how to be in relationship with someone who's more avoidant and then um, how to date if you're more avoidant. Yeah. Yeah. So I think if you're dating someone who's more avoidant, um, give them space, but invite them in. Hmm. Right. And so it's interesting, actually. I think the avoidant has an outer crust and a very soft inner shell. That's oh, actually delicious. feels <laughs> yeah, <Yay>. right. <laughs> but usually actually feels more vulnerable. Mm. Right. And so they really need a certain kind of safety to feel safe coming forward with their vulnerability. And so they often need the prompts to like, Hey, can you open the door to yourself a little bit? You know, so even, you know, having a discussion with them of when are better times, because if you ask an avoidant about something more personal when they're on their computer, it's not going to work very well. Like they need time to transition from one task to the other, you know, so sometimes with more of an avoidant partner, making time where you're going for a walk or really getting to sit down together or be on a video call together, right. And inviting them in can be helpful. Also being realistic in expectations because what happens with the avoidant is that they didn't have the developmental experience of, Oh, I can tune into myself and articulate what's going on. Mm -hmm. So they need time and support with that process. It's not just a behavioral change that one day they can do. It's actually something they need to develop. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah. And then um, if you happen to be more avoidant, I would start to connect. Well, first, I mean, as I talk about in the book, there's a lot of things about what avoidance can do to shift. And and um, I don't want to just say avoidance. I feel like we've all been throwing that around, like people with that style, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Um, but people with that proclivity or who are, you know, functioning from the avoidance style, um, a lot of it is about entering the body and waking up the body and being embodied sometimes for the first time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm right? And starting to tune into themselves more, but actually intentionally connecting with their attachment needs and drives. You don't actually want to be alone all the time, right? Right? Like feeling, allowing those desires um, to come back alive, which can be a difficult process because then you can feel all the grief too. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, I will say that I feel a little bit more comfortable looking at myself as like a really delicious loaf of sourdough bread (laughs) than than just this hard hearted motherfucker that can't get close to anybody. (laughs) Totally. (laughs) Um, So our next listener question here, is it possible to feel secure attachment if there's only one point of secure attachment? So for example, you know, I feel securely attached with one partner, but not another. Um, Or Mm -hmm. if that secure attachment is with people who are not my romantic partners, you know, my friends, my family, my therapist, stuff like that. Absolutely. Yes. You don't have, very few of us have secure attachment across the board with everyone in our life. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it could be, you know, um, one of several partners that you do feel very secure in. And to even sort of go back to that earlier question, like use that secure relationship then as a model of like, what's going well here that I can then look for in other relationships, right. Or advocate for in my relationships that don't feel as secure. Mm, Right. And so what about, how about this? When can you just blame your partner for their attachment <laughs> problems being all the issues and nothing? <laughs> we already said when... we can't do that. <laughs> right. Right. No, there are times there are, there have been times when I'm like, I say to one person, like this really is not you right now. Right? Mm. This really is a partner who, and it's usually someone who's, um, well, it happens in all of them, but I'll just say for a moment, like someone who's really not able to manage their, anxious, preoccupied attachment. And they're really starting to control their partner or have Mm -hmm. unrealistic expectations that it's not the other partner. And the other partner might be like, I'm communicating clearly. I'm giving a heads up. I'm following our agreements. (laughs) And this partner just keeps losing their shit. And so there are times where you have to be like, you need help with this. Mm You know, there's no more that I can do to reassure. Spark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there comes a time like there's no more reassurance someone can give, mm. you know? Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. And that's so hard to make that call sometimes because I, I think we do see it a lot that there can be times where you do everything right and yeah. you follow all the rules and, and you put in your utmost, you know? Um, but then that only goes so far sometimes. Yeah. 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 Exactly. I, it really was a wake up call for me. It was once, um, I was asking for more reassurance from one of my partners and he said, I'll give it to you, baby, but you got to take it in. Mm. And he just <laughs> called it out, you know? And I was like, yeah, you're right. I'm, not, I'm, I'm right. <laughs> yeah. like, like, thank you. You're going to give it, but I haven't been doing my work of really receiving it and believing it. Yikes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So, I can relate to. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. This was a, this, it, it is, was a really good book for me to read and I want to read it again because, um, there were a lot of juicy nuggets in there and I can't wait for all of you out there, dear listeners to read it as well. Um, so besides this book, what is coming up for you next and where can our listeners find out more about you? Yes. Well, they can go to my website, jessicafern.com. That's the easiest way. Um, but in addition to the book, so in the new year, I am going to be launching a secure attachment with self program. So it'll be an online program that will have a combination of videos, guided practices, meditations to do, and then live teachings with me and one of my partners. 
and it's going to be probably five or six months long. So it, wow. it really is a commitment. Wow. And that's be, I put a lot of thought into this because I was like, oh, all these like six weeks to whatever, 90 days. And I was like, mm-hmm. nope. Mm-hmm. If we're really going to hear heal our attachment, it takes six months to three years, honestly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so the program is sort of really wanting to support people in diving into healing their attachment and being secure within themselves, which will inevitably then change their relationships. Yeah. Awesome. Right. yeah. That's right. wonderful. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. Super exciting. Yeah. I'm excited about it. Uh, great. So we're at the end of our episode for today, but we are going to join Jessica for a bonus episode where we're going to talk some more about examples of how attachment crises actually show up or what they look like in non-monogamous relationships, uh, as well as just sort of what the different styles look like, maybe how you can identify them in yourself or others. So for our patrons, if you want to join us in that bonus episode, we will see you after this. And those of you who are in our patron group and our listeners, we would love to hear from you about what you thought about this episode. Um, what have you thought about your own attachment style? What have you noticed about how your attachment plays out in your multi-partner relationships? We would love to hear your thoughts. And the best place to share those with other listeners is on this episode's discussion thread in our private Facebook group or Discord chat. You can get access to these groups and join our exclusive community by going to patreon.com slash multiamory. In addition, you can share with us publicly on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. You can email us at info at multiamory.com. Multiamory is created and produced by Jace Lindgren, Emily Matlack, and me, Dedeker Winston. Our episodes are edited by Mauricio Balvanetta. Our social media wizard is Will McMillan. Our production assistants are Rachel Shenowork and Carson Collins. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com. 